Kikoko. Um, and if you are not familiar with Kikoko, Kikoko is um, a, amazing, amazing, known for their teas. Um, there's also some other new products coming out. And I know for me personally, after um, some very serious surgeries, um, that I rely very much on the sympathy um, with the turmeric and the ginger for inflammation. So we're going to hear a little bit more about Amanda's journey um, and the wonderful products that she's brought to market. Um, and we also have the pleasure of hearing from Judy Lee, Judy Yee today. Sorry, Judy. And um, Judy is also the CEO and co-founder co of Kazin and the Mad Lily brand. Um, there's some extensions she thinks she's going to share with us today as well. And we're going to get the privilege of hearing um, about the beverage consumption and also the mix between um, medicinal and social uses. And we're going to really explore that today. So I know that I'm excited to jump in um, and let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna throw a question out to you guys. Um, any of you can start. And if you don't, I'm gonna call on one of you. So we'll start really basic. How did you get involved in cannabis? How are you here today? Judy, I think you're on mute. There she is. <laughs> So, hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you, Soapbox, for uh, putting on this amazing forum. Um, so, I'm Judy Yee. I am the co-founder and CEO of Kazen. Uh, Kazen is a cannabis uh, company that is all around beverages. And so, we have a broad portfolio of brands and different products that really meet the diverse needs of consumers in this you know, vast and dynamic you know, landscape. Um, my background is, you know, I come from a, a pretty long history of food and beverage. Um, I was at Nestle, Earthbound Farm, Crystal Geyser, um, and took on different roles like product development, marketing, sales and distribution. And so, you know, my journey into cannabis was rather recent. Um, I guess I would consider myself as that kind of curious uh, user about, you know, three, four years ago. Um, growing up, you know, I, I, I was an avid athlete and dancer and grew up in a rather conservative household. Um, and so had a negative, but, you know, very false perception of cannabis. And so about a few years ago, when I was really looking to get back into my lifestyle after taking time off to raise my daughter, um, I found what I used to do to recover, to create resiliency just wasn't as effective. And so I, um, you know, consulted with you know trusted friends who are also kind of athletes themselves, and they said, "Hey, have you tried cannabis? You know, I'm not sure what your point of view is, Judy, but it's worked for me, and it's something you might want to try." So, anyway, so I found you know the trial and kind of the the experience to be super helpful, but I was thinking to myself, like, you know, um, I would probably adopt it more um, into my lifestyle and use it more if it had if there were more. Uh, formats that was, you know, maybe a little healthier, a little more discreet, and quite frankly, just more enjoyable and, and, and tasteful. Um, and so that was kind of the intersection that prompted me to start Kazen, you know, so I thought, gosh, I've got this great background, um, I can really bring into this industry, and use my experience as a new user, um, and create, you know, a, a, a portfolio of products that people can eventually come to love and trust. And so that was my my story. We started two years ago at Kazen, and um, super excited to be on the panel um, with a couple other trailblazers, you know, in the space. Yeah, really exciting. So it's going to be so interesting today, right? Because we have um, panelists with all different types of backgrounds and entrants at different points, right, within the industry. So I'm really excited. And um, also Amanda, I'd love to hear from you. So what got you in, in, into this cannabis journey, personally or professionally, whichever you'd like to share? Right. Well, thank you. First of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's lovely to be here. Uh, so I got in completely inadvertently and no intention of, of doing this. Uh, I uh, got, went into this business quite by mistake with a friend of mine, uh, Jen Chapin, who is my wonderful co-founder and co-CEO. Uh, we had a friend, this was a, seven years ago now, we had a friend with cancer, she had terminal cancer, and she was trying to use cannabis to help with her side effects because it does, when titrated properly, help. Some people, a lot of people with pain, nausea, appetite, lot, lack of appetite, and frankly, anxiety, the anxiety of, of having, having terminal cancer. 
But back in those bad old Wild West days, nobody knew what was in the products. There wasn't a brand that was low dose. There wasn't anything specific for women. It was sort of back in the the, the tie-dyed pot leaf days. And she was actually the one who said, I'm taking these products. I get crazy high. I ride the crazy train. I can't trust any brand. There needs to be a brand that's specifically for women that's lower dose, that can be trusted to... To, to, that I know I'm not going to ride the crazy train and that I know that whatever we say is in there is in there, which, of course, back then was very difficult to titrate. Um, so we, perhaps crazy people, said, oh, okay, we can do that. Well, let's do this. This sounds like a really uh, a, a great thing to do. It's much needed. A lot of patients really need products they can trust. We started to talk to our friends initially and then a lot of other women, hundreds of women, and they all said, look, if you can give us alternatives to pharmaceuticals and alcohol that is healthier, we would absolutely, and that was still efficacious, that we would we would do that. And so we decided after looking, talking to these women that we would come out with a line of products that was, would help with pain and inflammation, mm -hmm. uh, mood, and uh, libido mm -hmm. and sleep. And of course, sleep was the number one. And, and today we have other products, we, we, and we, but we did launch with a line of herbal teas, which was incredibly difficult to do. It took us uh, two and a half years and three science teams to crack that nut because we wanted it to taste good, not taste like weed. And we didn't want an, an oil slick. We, it needed to be homogenous. So that was that was our difficulty in the beginning, but we did it, and we have created a wellness brand, and we are a, a women's wellness brand, and now we have all sorts of other products, but they're all wellness. They all have nutraceuticals in them. Um, they're all very very healthy. It's it, we are coming out with what we believe is the female alternative, and men love them too, but to pharmaceuticals and alcohol in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. I love it. I know we're going to hear a little bit later from the consumer side, so it's interesting to to see on on all sides what it is that consumers are looking for, and then as brands, what we're able to to deliver, you know, and getting that messaging out. So we'll explore some of that today. Um, um, Austin, how how about you? How do, how did you get um involved in the science of plant extraction and and science as it relates to cannabis? Would love to hear about that. Yeah, thank you, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, so, hello, everybody. My name is Tom Stevenson. Uh, I am the Chief Innovation Officer uh, here at Pertosa, uh, and grateful to be here. I started my cannabis journey uh, over five years ago. Um, you know, I had a career in finance and tech, um, and ultimately, you know, became uh, an, an advisor and investor to technology companies. Uh, it was when I took a trip to Africa as a part of the MIT Innovation Laboratory, where for the first time I saw green leafy vegetables. Uh, being cultivated in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. Um, and I had a, a group of female funders, um, CEOs that were utilizing vertical farming uh, to be able to feed um, villages and be able to feed their communities. Um, I'm a person that's super curious, so I have to ask more questions about how, number one, they're cultivating in the middle of the desert with energy constraints, water, con water constraints. Um, and I found that a lot of that leading technology uh, was really being stimulated and, and catalyzed by the cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I decided to take a, a leap of faith uh, when I returned back to uh, the U.S. and said, hey, you know, I think there's a really big opportunity uh, to really get involved in the cannabis industry. Uh, and that's what I did. Um, so I found a lot of cultivators, extractors in Colorado and California. Uh, I started to leverage my skill set in advising and mentoring uh, helped start a couple different companies, uh, and ultimately found myself uh, leading a business unit at Eurofin Scientific, uh, the world's largest food, agriculture, uh, and pharmaceutical testing uh, laboratories. Um, there, my clients were CVS, Walgreens, and other traditional retailers, and we were literally testing for the quality of all types of beverages, uh, cosmetics, topicals, ingestibles, uh, beverages, uh, and it was there at Eurofin Scientific where I uncovered a, a really big problem uh, in the beverage category and, and what we're here to talk about today. Um, you know, at the time, CVS had a ton of different beverages that we were testing. I was testing tens and thousands of them. And 
to Amanda's point, there was a lot of separation and sedimentation, and the, the beverages weren't homogenous. Uh, and almost serendipitously, uh, you know, my partner uh, and uh, CEO, Ben Larson, who I knew over the years, came to me and said, I have this chief science officer, uh, a PhD chemist that is focused on using emulsion technology to make products, uh, use products homogenous uh, and efficacious. Um, I said, well, wow, that's amazing because I literally just told a huge retailer that all of their beverage products were, were failing potency tests. I think I understand why, uh, but let me test the product. Let me try the product. I took it to the lab and I found an amazing solution, um, which is an emulsion, which we're gonna talk about later, um, and ultimately use that emulsion to create fast acting, consistent, viable beverages uh, for both the cannabis and the hemp markets. Um, we started with our first CBD uh, product uh, and CPG product was with Vitacoco uh, infused on the hemp side. Uh, and over two years later, we've been able to uh, infuse tens of thousands of different products, uh, including most recently uh, PBRs uh, and cannabis seltzer. Um, so incredibly excited to be here and, and looking forward to just diving in and, and sharing more. Yeah, and I hear um, that there might be a uh, treat for the audience, Austin, after I believe we're going to do a drawing. Is that correct? Did you want to share with the group? They, I don't know if they're aware. Say it one more time. I didn't hear you. The drawing. The draw yeah, exactly. there'll be a drawing as well. We're going to supply uh, the group uh, sample kit. So we're going to have a drawing for all those that register so that you can get uh, one of uh, Vertosis uh, sample kits um, and this building block of starting uh, all, any and all the product development. So there's no one size that fits all uh, beverages. So we have a whole host of different emulsions and products that we're gonna send your way. So whether you're infusing uh, a seltzer water or you're infusing a tea or a plant-based protein drink, uh, you know, we have an emulsion for you, and I'm excited to, to share that kit with you so you can start your product development journey. Great. Thanks. I'm super excited. Uh, already interesting to hear um, so many differences. Uh, we've, we've weaved in some challenges there, I've heard, so we'll explore those a little bit more, right, with stability. And um, before we really um, jump in, I, I want to learn a little bit more from um, Amanda and Judy about their brands. But uh, AD, um, Adriana, why don't you tell us, I uh, know your journey a little bit, but why don't you share with us your journey in um, cannabis and how that's evolved? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, I'm Adriana with Soapbox Sample, and I will be sharing with all of you a lot of the consumer perspective. So I'm going to be sharing some, some data and some stats and talking about what consumers are really interested in this category, what drives them to make purchases uh, a little bit later. But as far as my background, you know, I work very closely with Jacqueline at Soapbox Sample, and what we do, uh, we serve all industries, not just cannabis. But I think the reason why we both connected with the cannabis industry on a deeper level is one, it's an emerging industry and they tend to need our help a lot to understand new audiences and new behaviors. And also I hope Jacqueline doesn't mind me sharing a little bit of her story, but Jacqueline was in uh, a serious car accident in 2015 and she discovered that using cannabis to help manage her pain was a lot more effective and a better solution than prescription medications. And while she was going through this personal journey of discovery, we started having um, our mainstream clients. So people who are in CPG or in beauty came to us and they said, hey, we're hearing about cannabis everywhere. Can you help us understand what this might mean for our brand? Can you help us understand how we can maybe harness this um, and develop our, our next generation of products or, or even just understand more about our consumers and their lifestyle. And then we saw, you know, there's just this amazing opportunity here because there are brands starting out in Kansas that are, you know, they're going to be leaders of the industry one day. And we, how amazing would it be if we could help them get there? Um, so that's really where the journey came along. And our biggest thing really is we see data informing the growth of the industry in so many positive ways. So a lot of the data that we collect, we self-fund and, and we share back with the industry because we think that that's really important. 
Great, thanks. All right, uh, Amanda and Judy, I, I want to dig in just a little bit more into your um, your brands and your journey and some some of the maybe challenges and how you overcame. One thing I, I, I heard in both the stories was um, you both mentioned different occasions, right? So, Amanda, you were talking about um, sleep. You were talking about pain. You were talking about sensuality. And um, we're talking about social. We're talking about, you know, all of these different occasions that maybe a cannabis consumer is now an all day consumer. And I'd love to hear, you know, maybe Amanda, you could share with us, you know, how how you identified those occasions and how much that really influenced, you know, your brand specifically. Yes. Uh, well, back then, uh, we were actually one of the first brands to to generate our products around benefits rather than around potency um, or ratios. Back in those days, most products came out with ratios, which we quickly realized the average person didn't understand at all. And so we we then did a lot of research, a lot of science, um, uh, which I happen to love. I'd, I have a degree in neuroscience, so I, I love that sort of thing. And uh, so we did a lot of research on what cannabinoid ratios do well for, for particular benefits or benefit, you know, mood states. And so, and when women said to us, well, you know, I find that cannabis can help with my sex life, or um, if you give me something that's going to help with my anxiety, uh, give me a little bit of a mood lift instead of drinking three glasses of wine, or we had a lot of women that were drinking wine to go to sleep, which I mean, how unhealthy is that? So, uh, and, and also, to be honest, a lot of women that reach the age of 50 and they can't drink wine anymore, the headaches, the, the, the just negative side effects, and so they are looking for alternatives. So we, 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 did, we do have ratios, obviously. For example, this one, which I think is your favorite. Um, this one is very high in CBD and low, so it's 20 milligrams CBD per tea bag. And it's only three milligrams of THC, but it's blended with ginger, black peppercorn, and turmeric, along with some other wonderful organic herbs um, that, that are also nutraceuticals that will, and plant medicines that deal with that state, that, that they have benefits of their own that, that contribute. So all of our teas are that way. Um, this is sensuality, which, which actually is really about Connect, connection it's a great party tea too it's just straight THC seven milligrams but we did research and discovered that five to seven milligrams was really the sweet spot for for sex if you get too high it actually has the opposite effect <laughs> and and, and it, it, it's it, it's interesting there's a threshold if you take too much THC you don't want to have sex or you go to sleep um, and then with with mood back then, what we were re reading about was a, or a lot of the women were saying, you know, when I do high THC, I sometimes get paranoid. Mm -hmm. So this is our highest one. This is positivity. It has 10 milligrams of THC. But we also put and we were one of the first to do this, too. I can proudly say because we were one of the first in um, uh, the legalized market. But. Uh, we put five milligrams of CBD with it to offset that paranoia or the, uh, the the racing heart or the unpleasant side effects that some people find with THC. So that was why we, we did that. Um, and then our sleep one, again, we were very early, one of the first to use CBN, which is a minor cannabinoid. It's actually a degraded THC. Uh, that was a whole nother adventure, trying to figure that one out in the lab and, and getting that and, and how expensive it was early on. We were making it ourselves. Um, so back those days. So, so yeah, so we, we use CBN, which is the drowsy cannabinoid in our with THC in our sleep tea, uh, tranquility with along with valerian root and chamomile and other delicious tasting teas. So very much our whole company and even our new products, we have uh, focus mints or calm mints or e everything we do goes into benefit categories. Mm -hmm. And um, so you showed us some of your beautiful packaging. So cur a little curious about um, how that played into your to your branding and, and how it represents your brand and, and you personally. Well, thank you for asking about that. Thanks. We we had fun with that. We so we decided that 
there needed to be packaging that looked professional and that appealed to women and that jumped off the shelves. Something we wanted it to be something you'd be proud to have in your kitchen or in your pantry and that you didn't want to hide away. Um, so you'll notice that we never use weed leaves. We never we never use the plant and pictures of nugs or buds or anything. We 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 try and keep it that um, the the yummy mummies would be proud to have this in their pantry and wouldn't feel the need to hide it from their book club. Mm -hmm. um, so we also hired uh, we hire artists, female artists to do all our packaging. So uh, this is Lisa Congdon, who is a quite a well known illust illustrator. So we do we use we use art, female artists to do the illustration. And obviously, they're very brightly colored. This is our latest one, Buzz Mints, which is just mm -hmm. five milligrams of THC with vitamin D in it. So this is the healthy, this is the healthy form of what we call our, our healthy alternative to a gummy, because gummies are sugar and THC, and we're, right. these are sugar free with xylitol and and they have vitamin D in them, which we all need right now. So that's the sort of direction we we're headed in. But we wanted packaging that was safe, that women felt safe with. So if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. I know that the, the initial individual sort of envelope packets just look so beautiful as they are displayed. So it's always I've, I've always just noticed and admired. So I had to ask. Um, and Judy, you know, um, well, we're talking about occasions and talking about packaging. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about how the occasions played into, um, you know, Kazen, Matt Lilly. I'd love to hear a little bit about some of your packaging um, choices because I know that they weren't the easiest. Um, so I'd love to hear that from you. Yeah, so, you know, two years ago when we finally uh, formed the company, it was kind of like, you know, you, you see those posters where you had like 20 arrows, like where do you start, right? right? And coming from the mainstream world of CPG, I'm like, you know what? Consumer is the boss. So if you don't absolutely know who you're trying to attract, who you're trying to appeal, you're not going to be successful. And so, so I resisted the urge to jump in. And instead, we're like, you know, we're going to go on a listening tour. We're going to go immerse ourselves in the consumer's mind and their, their, their living space, their behaviors to understand, you know, why are they choosing what they're choosing? What is getting in their way? What are their dissatisfaction? What is their preferred method of consumption? Why or why not? Um, is a substituting something that's already in their life, you know, so just like this huge blue sky of like consumer immersion. Um, coming out of that, we we were able to identify, you know, segmentation of consumers mm -hmm. uh, and and really understand like, OK, this is what unites this group. You know, this group is all around, you know, they want THC. They know they're very familiar with that. They want it in, you know, in a good price and they want it um, clean and they want it to be trusted, right? Versus this group is like, hey, I'm curious, but um, I've heard about CBD. I'm scared of THC. Um, and I've had a bad trip when I was in high school on a brand. <laughs> um, as Amanda said earlier, that crazy train, right? We all have one of those stories. Um, so you have like, you know, those are just two very basic examples. And we were then able to say, okay, to start, we're not going to be everything to everybody, but we're going to pick a couple different paths. And so from there, once we knew who we're going after, then we got into like, okay, what is the need? You know, if you're already consuming cannabis, but you're open to drinks, like what would that look like for you? And so for that consumer, as an example, someone who's familiar, someone who may be smoking today, someone who is familiar with edibles, you know, we designed a product called Eshops. Here, so this is a hundred milligram of glorious THC, <laughs> um, and you know, and we 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 know that we were not a first mover here. This is a space that's been, you know, occupied for a long time. But what we knew what there were gaps um, in this in this size. You know, there were a lot of um, high fructose corn syrup usage. You know, in the ingredients, um, flavors that just doesn't resonate with with consumers as well. Um, and so we just took this product and, you know, went into the market knowing that it's already there, but how do we make it better? How do we make the experience better for those users? And so this is one example of a usage occasion target consumer that we went after. And then another group that we identified, you know, is um, folks that kind of are seeking um, cannabis much more for wellness. 
So, you know, so they are looking for a, a better night's sleep or they're looking for a way to unwind. Um, and so we came up with a, a product um, called Madly Lemon Dream Tonic. So mm -hmm. it has um, CBN um, as well, and it's um, infused with lemon, dream, um, lemon balm and lavender. Um, and then, you know, it's a shot format, so it, it's a little bit different than um, other formats out there. And so, you know, this goes after, you know, the, the more health and wellness seeking consumer. And then lastly, um, the kind of curious crowd that I spoke with, you know, is really, you know, like, I don't really know what my dosage level is, um, but I'm very curious. And also what I'm looking to replace is alcohol. What I'm looking to replace, you know, is some other means that isn't, you know, as healthy for, for me right now. And so we came up with, you know, a product, I mean, quite honestly, that you could probably find at Whole Foods. You know, we wanted, we know that this is a consumer that have lots of questions. They're a little bit fearful, but they're leaning in and they're curious. So you got to make a product that's much more familiar to them, you know, in terms of the packaging and how it shows up, the language you use, um, how you talk about cannabis, how do you talk about the effects? You know, we don't, talk, we don't use the word high, you know, it's, a, it's about uplifting experience, you know, um, and this product is super clean, you know, just four ingredients, because we know this consumer is also, you know, it, it's not just going after the effects. They want to know what they're putting in their body holistically, not just the cannabis is made with quality and clean ingredients. Um, and so this product is, you know, five and five, so five CBD, five THC, um, no, no sweeteners, no sugar added. It's just naturally, um, you know, sweetened by the juice that we use. Um, and, you know, it's, um, it's a product that, you know, is, is, is low enough and appealing and familiar enough for someone who may not have tr tried cannabis otherwise would, would find, you know, really interesting. And, and, you know, this is kind of like, I call it the pandemic parent drink, <laughs> That's what we're thinking of, you know, um, you know, a lot of times people talk about like, my days are blurred, right? You wake up and it, it just, and also you find yourself like going to bed, like, where is those where's those breaks and so a lot of people are finding you know drinking mad lily right after the work day you're getting ready to go into you know your evening of family life or personal life it's just a nice transition and so people are also finding ways to use cannabis to break the mundane you know um and and to create new rituals at home um and so that's what's also been exciting you know in the cannabis beverage space is we're kind of we're kind of accelerating during unprecedented times where people are, you know, forming new behaviors, new occasions. Um, and so it's also an opportunity for style. Right, right. Yeah. So we're early in the business and then, um, you know, that we have this additional challenge going on, right? So um, good for pivoting, good, good for pivoting. Um, so Adriana, we just heard, you know, a lot um, from both Judy and Amanda. And I heard things like um, we talked to consumers and we did segmentations and we wanted to know about the cannabis consumer. So Adriana, I, I, I'm just curious, like what is the, um, based on research, you know, what is the cannabis beverage consumer? Are, are they the same? What do we know about, what do we know about cannabis consumers and cannabis beverage consumers? So what, what we do know about cannabis beverage consumers is that they are thirsty. Um, they, we saw some really interesting trends popping up in the data, particularly this year. And I think a lot of it reflects the point that Judy just made that people are looking for um, new rituals in their home. So one mm -hmm. thing that we saw is, and we saw a big jump um, in adoption rates this year. So we our uh, can opinion poll, which goes out every two weeks to 1000 cannabis consumers in November of 2020 showed that 32% had tried a cannabis beverage in the last month. That's 32% of cannabis consumers. Then fast forward to January, 2021, we just got some fresh data in this morning. 49% uh, of cannabis consumers had, had tried a cannabis beverage. So that's a big jump, 17% in just two months. It's, it's pretty wow. amazing. And of course we've seen big swings, big changes because of COVID. And, and, and this is another one of those really big changes not necessarily because of COVID. I think it's also because people are excited about this category, but it's interesting to see that. I'm just gonna share a slide with you guys because I'm gonna be throwing out a lot of stats and I wanna make sure that uh, we don't lose anything here. So 
I also want to share with you that one of the main reasons why people are not adopting cannabis beverage consumption is that they don't know that it exists, right? Mm -hmm. So amongst people who haven't tried it, they said to us, we just don't know that this is an option. Um, so there's a lot of room here for brands to come in, educate consumers, and really come in and sort of own this space, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of room to grow here. Um, something else I want to mention is that we're seeing a lot of interesting trends in terms of the relationship between alcohol and cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about social occasions and Judy mentioned that a lot of her products are meant to replace alcohol. And that is definitely a, a driving force behind people adopting cannabis beverages. What we're also seeing is that um, there's a significant portion of people that are choosing both. They're consuming both cannabis and alcohol at the same time, about 40%. And whether they decide to do one or the other or both really just depends on the occasion. I have a couple of quotes here that I want to read to you from um, some of our survey participants. So one person said, I have to be in a good mood to drink alcohol and I have to be with people I trust when I drink alcohol. Whereas I can be in a good mood or bad mood to drink cannabis beverages and it doesn't matter who is around. So that's kind of interesting. Then another person commented, separate person, if I'm at home and I know I won't be going out anywhere, I'll do both for ultimate relaxation. Uh, so I think it's 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 really nice to hear directly from consumers what their experiences are and, and why they're choosing one or the other. The last point I wanna make here um, is that for this group in particular, flavor is so, so important. Uh, and that's compared to other groups, we really see that cannabis beverage consumers think that flavor is is key. Um, it's one of the top reasons for, for choosing a cannabis beverage is because they want to enjoy the flavor. And when you compare uh, beverage consumers with edible consumers, it really paints an even more stark contrast because with edibles consumers, only 10% say that flavor is the top consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's so so interesting. So is the data that you're seeing, I know you're in data all the time, is it is it backing up, you know, this this trend, this buzz that cannabis beverages really are kind of the, the next big thing for us? Is that what you're seeing in your data? Yeah, absolutely. It definitely reflects that. Consumers are excited to try new products. They want to see new things on the market. They're waiting for the day when they can go into the dispensary and, and easily pick them up. Um, some dispensaries, you know, can't even keep products in stock. So the other reason why I think thought leaders and, and people in cannabis who are keeping their eyes on trends are so excited about this market is because people who, who adopt cannabis beverages as part of their routine, it's likely to become for them a daily routine, a weekly routine. They're going to be those repeat customers that really drive sales. Uh, so with, um, we looked at uh, coffee and tea, cannabis infused coffee and tea specifically, and people who had tried those beverages, 42% said so that they were likely to make it a part of their weekly routine and consume it at least once a week. So people are definitely excited to see, uh, to see how the market grows. And I think there's almost you know, unlimited opportunities here. Yeah, well, it sounds like um, the, the, the industry itself and this category in particular is uh, really, you know, the, the hot buzz and, and congratulations to uh, both Amanda and Judy for, for being leaders in that space. And, you know, what, what we've heard about is flavor, consumers, packaging, you know, but what is always um, interesting, right, is to think, you know, how are we really going from a plant right, to a beverage, right? Like, what is that process and what are some of the challenges as you come out in, a, in the brand with, you know, uh, with packaging and stability? And I'd love to hear, Austin, from you, you know, some of those challenges as it relates to, to formulation and how do you um, ensure stability and things like that. If you could share, I, I know we would be really interested to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to, to share more. Um, I'm looking for the control to share my screen. Get that control. Perfect. So I'll share a little bit of insights from you and um, exactly 
Well, so we have Got it. sharing my screen. So um, Jacqueline, you mentioned it exactly. How do we get from, from the plant uh, to a beautifully crafted beverage uh, like Mad Lily? Um, well, it's a process um, like any other process. Um, it starts with cultivating uh, amazing botanicals. Um, you have the cultivation experience, you build up the plant, uh, and then ultimately once the plant is harvested, um, then it gets into extracts. Um, and the extracts are the oils. Um, the oils are, are capture, uh, in many instances, either the full botanical profile of the plant, uh, cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, um, and that ultimately um, can be distilled down uh, into distillates, which remove uh, a lot of the you know, flavor attributes of the plant. So removing the terpenes, removing the flavonoids, and leaving just a pure cannabinoid, um, either singular cannabinoid like THC or CBD. Um, there's also opportunity um, to uh, contain the full profile of the plant. Um, so you have a full spectrum or broad spectrum, um, but inherently you start with, with an oil. Uh, and then that's where we get started at Vertosa. Uh, it's taking the oil and then turning that into an emulsion. Uh, and an emulsion is, is very uh, common and very familiar for anyone that is in product development in the food industry. Um, your most common everyday use emulsion uh, is, is salad dressing. And the reason um, that you're familiar with it uh, is because everyone knows that water and oil doesn't mix. Um, and so you have to create uh, an emulsion like you find in salad dressing uh, to make oil and water mix and mix well. Um, when we take it one step further, you know, what's really important in designing a cannabis beverage uh, is having a predictable and repeatable and consistent experience. Um, you know, like drinking a Coca-Cola, you want to have the same experience with Coca-Cola if you crack open a can in, in New York as if you cracked open a can here in California. Um, and so creating a consistent experience is how Vertosa gets involved in taking that oil and then turning it into an emulsion. Uh, and we use a process, uh, a couple of different processes that, be, that can be used. Um, it's apparently high energy. Uh, one process is called sonication, uh, and the other process is called, uh, well, it uses a, a microfluidics uh, process, um, but inherently it's one is high vibration, high vibration energy waves, and the other is high pressure. And inherently what we're doing, we're taking that oil and take, adding energy and breaking that oil down into really, really small oil droplets. Uh, and that is what's seen uh, in an emulsion and able to be dispersed evenly throughout a cannabis beverage like Mad Lily. And so the benefit, if you think about this, uh, is a fast set and a predictable experience that mimics the consumption of alcohol. Um, so, you know, to have a cannabis experience, you have to get the cannabis oils past the brain blood barrier uh, and into your blood system so that it can antagonize or attach to your CB1 and CB2 receptors. And so I'm sure a lot of people on this call have had that experience back in college or, you know, a few years ago, um, whenever their first cannabis, cannabis consumption uh, experience was, but that experience with a brownie or a cookie. Um, and they ate that brownie and they liked the taste of that brownie, but they didn't feel anything. They waited for an hour and they said, wow, that chocolate was really, really good. I want to eat a little bit more, see if anything kicks in. And then they eat a little bit more, but they still don't feel anything. But then two hours later, boom, they feel everything. Uh, and they're left laying on the couch and out for the for you know the next eight hours. And that's because that oil that was baked into that brownie ultimately had to go through your digestive tract and be metabolized. And so it takes time. Everyone metabolizes different. Women metabolize things different than men. Um, people over 40 metabolize things uh, different than people under 30. Everyone, you know, uh, body mass has an impact on how you metabolize things. So everyone metabolizes a little bit different. But if you apply an emulsion technology like Vertosa, we do a lot of that work up front. We make a fast acting onset by taking that big old oil droplet and making it really small. And so I kind of show you how that works is the benefit of emulsion is if you think of that brain blood barrier as a chain link fence, taking that traditional oil 
that you had in that college brownie experience is like taking a big old beach ball and trying to push it through the chain link fence. It's not going to happen. It's going to bounce back every time until it goes through your digestive tract and ultimately gets metabolized. Um, and then it starts to absorb. But when you use emo emotion science, either energy, high energy using vibrational waves or you're using high pressure, then you're taking that beach ball and then you're turning it into like a jar full of marbles or a pile of gravel. And so now you take that handful of marbles and you throw that through the chain link fence, it all passes through because uh, it's a lot smaller. And so that's why when you see on packages, people talk about fast onset or sublingual absorption, it's because we're taking that big old beach ball and turning it into a bunch of little marbles. So therefore, when you're taking a mad lily and you're sipping it and you're savoring it, you're able to actually start to absorb the cannabinoids in the sublingual mucosal, it right in your mouth before it even hits your digestive tract, which then ultimately takes a lot of pressure off of your liver and it provi and provides a more healthier alternative to consumption that is more predictable and faster acting so that a consumer can really start to understand exactly what the experience is, what one beverage will do to them, what two beverages will do to them. And they don't need to, to wait to fill that experience. Um, so ultimately it's that conversion of oil to an emulsion and then an infusion uh, through energy that we're able to create all these amazing products um, that you're seeing on retailer shelves today. Yeah, the science is just absolutely incredible. Like, and and how do you deal with um, uh, like the the potency and serving size? So I know it's a challenge. You know, if you're going to share, for example, a, 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 a bottle of wine, right, with a, with a friend, um, the, you know, as you're drinking the wine, even when there's only a quarter of the bottle of wine left, right, it has the same amount of alcohol as the first part. I, I, is that what this process is kind of about? Exactly, um, Jack Cohen. So, bottle of wine. So, another uh, female led brand, House Osaka, something that we've used. Beautiful packaging, 750 milliliter bottle using uh, grapes from Napa Valley. It's really, really important so you start to have a concept of meter dosing. You want to be able to crack open this bottle and share it with your group of friends. So, we want to know that in every single glass, there's exactly five milligrams of THC. And that's all about suspension. And so, as I was mentioning earlier on the call, you know, I had the benefit of working at a third party analytical chemistry laboratory, Eurofin Scientific, and I saw a lot of beverage products that fall out of suspension. Um, and what that means is that the encapsulation, you know, what we use to take that beach ball and make it into, into small marbles breaks. Um, Amanda was talking about it earlier about, you know, an oil slick. It's inherently the oil is separating and therefore in early cannabis beverages, it was kind of like playing cannabis roulette where you didn't know in that first swig if you were getting 10 milligrams or 100 milligrams. But if you use the right encapsulation technology, the right emulsion technology, like we do at Vertosa, you're able to hit a homogenous dispersion throughout the entire batch. It's not going to separate. It's not going to float to the top. It's not going to sink to the bottom. Instead, it's going to be evenly suspended so that you know that if you pour out exactly one glass, one glass is going to be five milliliters. And the second glass will be five milligrams. And the third glass will be five milligrams. And so therefore, you're having that predictable, repeatable, and metered experience each and every time. Wow, I, we could we could spend probably all afternoon, right? Um, talking about the various aspects, and I, I have to say, you know, in in hearing the stories, and it's just really amazing to think of really how far we have come from just you know the stoner days, right, of this plant and the image that it has, and now we've got you know science and research and data and health benefits and you know bringing that to market obviously has you know lots of challenges and we're just at the forefront so um it'll be amazing we should all get back together in uh, a couple of years i'm sure we'll talk many times before then though and and compare right where we are now to where we're going so um we're coming up on time we've got just under 10 minutes and you know, I, I would love to hear, um, you know, from the from the from the group, you know, what do you, what is it that you think is is next? Um, um, 
you know, what, what, what's going to come next in this market, in this space in 2021? Uh, Amanda, would you like to share what your thoughts are? Yeah, I think we will see a proliferation of brands. We'll get, uh, hopefully, we'll get the distribution issues fixed right. with with, with uh, beverages. That is probably right now. Is uh, dispensaries also not having enough cold storage? Mm -hmm. um, not really being built around beverages, uh, and then and then distributors. It is uh, because there's a limit to what you can carry. There are issues because mm -hmm. beverages are heavy and they're large and they take up a lot of square footage in the trucks. And so um, that has to be figured out. It will get figured out without a doubt. And I sure. I, I, I anticipate that this year, and, and in fact, that's what's holding us from getting into RTDs. We have plans to get into RTDs, mm -hmm. uh, but you probably won't see a Kikoko RTD till 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is, it is in development. Um, because we believe in in it, we just there's just some inherent issues right now that need to be sorted out first. But I applaud the the the, the brave pioneers because I know what it's like to be a pioneer. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you really <laughs> paving the way for all of us. Yeah, it's actually very very tough. There is definitely a lot of challenges, right, with beverages uh, across the board. Um, so Judy, what do you think um, is is coming up next, 2021 or even even beyond? Yeah, on the product side, I think you're still continue to see a lot of movement, um, innovation in a low dose space, um, whether it's flavor development, form factors, um, unique packaging. Um, I also think the area of functional drinks will continue to grow. You know, Amanda and I shared um, our products around sleep um, and, you know, relaxation. But if you look ahead, you know, I uh, coming from the food and bev side of product innovation, you know, immunity is a big one on the mainstream side of things, um, weight management, um, as well as, um, you know, sports performance. So no reason why those needs the same consumers um, I'll also, you know, we can have that in cannabis beverages, you know, I think it actually will be really, really um, interesting and, and get some more traction as well. Um, and then so those are product and then on the business kind of like supply chain side of things, I think Amanda hit it right on the nail. Um, I think distribution is kind of the, the next bastion of, of innovation, you know, um, uh, Austin spoke about emulsion. That was huge. That was a game changer that allowed a lot of brands that had great ideas. Um, and, you know, but to not have the emulsion technology available, there, there is no way we would have been able to even be at the point of entry, you know, for a cannabis beverage that is enjoyable and predictable and safe. So now that that you know technology is is there, the next thing is about, about distribution and sales. Um, you know, building on what Amanda's saying, I think the retail side of things is also really interesting. You know, before the pandemic hits, there were definitely a growing number of on-site consumption lounges, you know, restaurants right. getting permitted to service products. Um, you know, beverages, unlike food and other edibles, it is a highly impulsive usage occasion. You know, when I used to develop products, I had two different innovation streams. One was for impulse occasions, impulse channels. The other one was for planned consumption, mm -hmm. planned mm -hmm. channel. Right now, cannabis is a planned occasion on steroids. You, you, know, you think about it, it's like, okay, I kind of have to know what I want to buy. I need to drive uh, for hours to get it in some locations. Um, and then it gets, then I pick it up. I can't consume it. Then I have to, I have to bring it somewhere else. And so it, it's a lot of, um, a lot of work, right? From, right. from the point of like, I think I want one to the point of consumption. I think that you know, with with a um, post COVID world, I'm hopeful that the, you know, the early activities around on site consumption will continue to grow. Um, and I think that is also going to open the floodgates for trial and adoption. Um, and so, yeah, so I think that there's only um, opportunities um, ahead of us. Um, and I think, you know, we we're definitely on on the on the right on the right uh, step towards that. Yeah, it's a lot. So much. It's so so much more exciting stuff. I know. Um, you know, just in the last five years, you know what we've seen in movement of of the industry and the consumer adoption and image and use is just so incredible for it to be moving at the at the speed it is. And we're going to have some mainstream entrants, you know, coming up with around legalization. So it's going to be an interesting space, I think. Um, Austin, do you have any uh, predictions for twenty 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 one? 
Uh, yes, of course. I think, you know, Judy and Amanda did a great job of uh, nailing, um, you know, a lot of uh, future innovation in this work. Um, you know, but I'm a products guy. I love products, all types of products. I'm the guy that takes, you know, 25 different supplements a day. Um, and I think it's, it's really kind of built around, uh, innovation's really built around designing new experiences. And so, you know, you see Amanda and Judy uh, companies, both are exploring minor cannabinoids. Um, you know, the top three reasons people are looking for cannabis is really pain, stress, and, and sleep. Um, and so you're able to really tackle that sleep function uh, with the sedative cannabinoid CBN and incorporating other functional ingredients like valerian root, which Amanda is doing, or chamomile extract, um, like Judy is doing, and um, other uh, functionals like magnesium or tryptophan or melatonin, and incorporating incorporating those with a lot of different cannabinoids. Um, you know, we mentioned you know better uh, energy. You know, the use of THCV, you're gonna you're gonna see a lot. Uh, in terms of, you know, kind of a stimulating the buzz, uh, but without the munchies. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, anecdotal research around uh, THCV, you know, being an appetite suppressant. Um, I think that can get really, really interesting. And then the myriad of other different cannabinoids, but also the terpenes, um, and specifically terpenes um, that are associated with uplifting experiences. Um, so, you know, things like alpha pinene, uh, for example, or limonene uh, that you see in Jack Herrera mm -hmm. strains and sour diesel strains. So I think, you know, there's this process that I, I walked through of breaking down the plant and then building it back up. And so as consumers start to ask more questions, and we see this in mainstream CPG and beverage, they're looking for more botanical herbaceous type of, of profiles. You know, cannabis lends itself exceptionally well uh, to that development. Um, you can break down the plant uh, through extraction methods and then build it back up. And so using the full plant and some of its more targeted effects or targeted compounds and putting them in a formula together so you can design better energy, so that you can design a euphoric experience or design better sleep is where you're going to start to see product innovation. And then on top of that, it's like, you know, the big problem that Adriana was talking about was consumer awareness. And so in the next few years, as you have more positive legislation, uh, and we, you know, we do believe as a cannabis industry that this new administration, uh, both from the executive level and the congressional level, is going to be positive for the, the cannabis industry as a whole. You're going to see more and more mainstream CPG companies innovate with cannabis. Um, you saw it this year um, it was, with PBR, for example. They said, we're going to be a functional beverage company. Um, you're going to see a lot more of that um, this year is in 2021-22. Uh, as we're working with a ton of different brands that folks are familiar with that you see at GT, uh, you see at Whole Foods and you see um, at uh, 7-Eleven and you see um, at other uh, chain retailers today, you're going to see these folks come to market. You're going to see these folks design um, beverages and products with cannabinoids. Um, and that's only going to promote user adoption, promote trust, uh, and, and ultimately normalize uh, the consumption of cannabis. Yeah, and so a lot's going to happen pretty quickly here, I think, but then will, there'll be a lot of innovation and evolution for, for many years to come. I think we have a slide um, with how to, how to contact everyone, if we could put that up, and then um, while people are taking a look, um, if you'd like to contact any of us, our information will be available on the screen. And um, finally, maybe, um, Adriana, you can close us out. Um, and tell us, you know, you hear all this exciting things happening. So what is your advice to brands in 2021 as it relates to um, cannabis beverages or cannabis in, in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I could have said it better than any of our, our, of our speakers. So I just want to do a quick shout out to the people who are sending messages in the chat. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to answer all of your questions, but we will leave this slide up for a couple of minutes after we wrap up. So feel free to reach out with your questions and, and we'll get some answers and we'll continue this really interesting conversation. Yeah, so thank you every, um, everybody so much. Um, this is the end of our chat for today. We will leave the screen up and we'll see if we can get to, um, to some questions, but you have everyone's contact information here if you'd like to learn more. Um, and we're excited for everyone to follow along as um, this cannabis uh, beverage industry continues to explode and evolve. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.